when I first saw this opening, I was a bit confused. I did not know what I just saw. It was a confusing opening is because uh, what we needed to see to understand what they were showing us was hidden underground. We find a lot of things hidden in this third episode. I'm G, and this is the G-Spot. What I want to talk about with the tragic, tragic events that occurred in episode three is how shocking Nacho's death was, despite the fact that we absolutely should have known it was coming. Right from the start, they let us know Nacho is gonna die. So yes, the first time you see this opening, it is very confusing, but they immediately start with giving us some indirect evidence that that actually is Nacho's grave. Uh, the first piece of indirect evidence we get is uh, the last shot on this grave is this broken piece of glass that Nacho used. Um, and then the scene ends. The next thing we see is uh, Nacho's making the getaway in the truck. There's a close up of the uh, back of the truck, the, the tail bed of the truck, and there's all broken glass in the tail bed of the truck. And then uh, the first shot inside the truck is a close up of the floor and there's broken glass bouncing around on uh, the inside floor of the truck. So uh, we did get an indirect hint right from the start by them going from the piece of broken glass at the uh, grave to the broken glass in Nacho's truck, letting us know this opening is directly related to Nacho. So Nacho pulls over with the truck. He thinks about a second of, of handing a standoff, but he doesn't do that. And he runs and hides in the oil tanker and then submerges himself in a small pool of oil. There's not many things uh, that are a better representation of death uh, than oil. It's literally killing everybody on the planet. The, the twins come by, they, they don't find him because he's hiding. And then Nacho makes it to uh, the gas station. Uh, at the gas station, we see that Nacho is hiding some money in his bag. And we see that Nacho is uh, really kind of lost at this point. He does not know what to do. We don't know, there is this sense of loss throughout the scene. Uh, we certainly don't know where he is. The service station doesn't have a name. Uh, the only sign we see is a sign that says service. So we do really get the sense of being lost in this strange remote place. We see him uh, call his father, uh, he doesn't even know why he's calling his father. He just doesn't know what else to do. We hear his father ask, uh, Nacho, where are you? You sound strange. Um, again, enforcing this idea that N Nacho's really lost at this moment. His father is at a loss for words. He doesn't know what else to tell Nacho because they've been through this so many times and his father just leaves him with the advice, you need to call the police. Uh, Nacho hangs up. He knows he's not going to call the police. He breaks down for a minute because, again, he's so lost. But I think this is the moment where Nacho really uh, accepts his death. He's crying, and then he goes to this little giggle. And uh, I think we see him accept his fate, accept his death at that moment, which makes sense because he then calls Gus and tells Gus, I know you need me dead in order to get out of the situation you've made. Uh, so here is a direct piece of evidence that Nacho's going to die. Uh, he says to Gus, I know you need me dead. Tell me the story that you want me to sell and I'll sell it. So they finesse that really, really well because Nacho directly tells us he needs to die. But then he doesn't say to Gus, fine, you can kill me or I'll die. He says, I'll agree to whatever story you tell me to. So um, again, the agreement was about selling a particular story. And what I think the creators did throughout the episode, what I think they knew uh, 
they could depend on throughout the episode is the viewers holding on to any bit of hope they would get uh, of, for the possibility that, La, uh, that Nacho was going to make it out of this alive. I'm pretty sure they knew they could count on that because at moments like this, when Nacho says, I know you need me to die, and then he says, um, I'll sell whatever story you want me to, there was a bit of hope from me that, well, he didn't agree to die, he agreed to tell a certain story, so maybe he doesn't really have to die. Uh, so, anyways, uh, Nacho leaves the gas station, and we see he leaves uh, the money he had hidden, he leaves it all behind for the gas station, uh, for the service attendant, uh, again, indirectly letting us know um, he's done. It's over for him. He doesn't even need any money anymore. Uh, the next time we see Nacho, he is being hidden in a truck where they usually hide their product. Uh, Mike gets him out and Nacho has his last meal. Uh, during this, Nacho says, when is it? And Mike says, tomorrow. Uh, again, pretty direct evidence that we are going to see Nacho die, but there's that bit of hope. They didn't say what was tomorrow. Uh, you know, who knows what tomorrow is? Hopefully it's not uh, Nacho's execution, holding on to that little, any bit of hope that we could possibly get. So yeah, they said something's tomorrow, but they didn't say Nacho was gonna die tomorrow, but he is having his last meal. Uh, again, they finessed this so well. Then uh, Victor comes in and tells Mike, you gotta mess Nacho up because he looks too pretty. Mike tells, Victor to leave and then there are some there's a hidden bottle of alcohol in two hidden glasses uh, In a locker and Mike takes him out and he says first things first him and uh, Nacho have a drink We, we actually don't see Nacho drink, but uh, uh, So and then they cut uh, Mike has his drink hits the table and they cut you know when they cut from that in my head is oh did uh, Nacho and Mike just make a plan to save Nacho. In the next scene, we see uh, Nacho, Gus, and Mike in the trailer. And again, we're given like a really direct statement uh, that Nacho's going to die real soon. And that is uh, Mike tells him, you know, uh, get up, run past Victor, and he'll take care of it. And Nacho says, you mean he'll put me down. But then we see Mike go outside and tell Gus that he wants to be there. Uh, and again, why does Mike want to be there? Do him and Nacho have a secret plan? Is he going to save Nacho? Cut back into the trailer and we come across another hidden thing. Uh, Nacho has a glass of water and uh, there's, it's even hard to tell that there's something hidden in it. You just know that he sees something. Um, what was hidden in Nacho's glass of water was the broken piece of glass that he uses at the end of the episode. And that's why we couldn't see it. Even when they give us that shot from the bottom of the glass, uh, at least I, I couldn't really tell what was in the glass. And then we get to the final scene. A couple things about the final scene. Uh, before Nacho starts talking, uh, right when Don Juan says to him, there's good deaths and bad deaths, uh, we get a shot from inside, uh, I think it would be the Salamanca's car, it, it, it would have to be, and uh, there's a whole bunch of like surgical tools for torture uh, hidden in the car. I'm really, really glad we were spared from any sort of torture uh, to Nacho, I just, I'm really, really glad we were spared of that. But anyways, uh, so we see the tools in the back of the car. Then they cut to a shot behind Nacho and we see him squeeze his hand as, as his wrists are zip tied and a little bit of blood uh, comes from the palm of his hand. And so uh, it's a hint that Nacho is hiding something in his hand. Then Nacho gives his big speech, which was great. I am so glad that Nacho had that moment to tell the Salamancas exactly what he thinks of them. Oh, the other great, great part about his speech is when he tells Hector that he's the one that switched his pills for sugar pills. And then he looks at Gus and says, but this asshole saved you. 
Uh, that was really great. So anyways, Nacho makes his speech and then he makes his move. At this moment, they cut to Mike and Mike uh, says, I think he says, come on, do it. He says something like that, do it. And so again, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Mike knows what Nacho's up to right now. That means that Mike and Nacho have a plan. It, can't imagine what this plan is, how they're gonna get Nacho out of this situation, but apparently they have a plan. So, you know, right down to the last second, they give us reason to have hope, and then they take all the hope away from us. They were telling us repeatedly, indirectly and directly, through the episode, Nacho is gonna die, and yet the moment that Nacho dies, is totally and completely shocking. Really unbelievable, uh, just great job all around. Um, and that's uh, Nacho's death. Nacho is done. I do think that we can assume that part of the reason Mike went was because Mike is who buried Nacho. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we see that in a future episode, but I don't know, whatever. But I do think we can assume that Mike buried him, gave him a proper burial, and that's part of why he wanted to go along. The first time we see Jimmy and Kim in this episode, we see Jimmy take a painting off a wall, and then he reveals that their plan is hidden behind this painting, which is kind of really neat. I never thought of hiding anything in a painting like that, but they are hiding their plan there. And the plan is still hidden from us. We see one name, but it's not recognizable. Uh, and then nothing else really makes sense except for uh, the namaste that Jimmy puts on there, which is obviously Howard's license plate. And this painting uh, is something that we did see in the first episode of this season, the opening of it, uh, when they were moving things out of the mansion. This painting is one of the things that they move out of the mansion. It's really like a happy romantic scene. Uh, they're both up uh, with energy. They're supporting one another, uh, tr trying to think of ideas together. Kim mentions, why don't we just use Howard's actual car? And at first Jimmy's like, no, 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 that's a bad idea. Then we see Jimmy like kind of feels bad that he poo-pooed Kim's idea so quickly. So he goes back to it. He's like, oh, but you know what would make that idea work? So, you know, they are working together, uh, being supportive of one another. They are dressing each other. Jimmy zips Kim up. Then we see Kim tying Jimmy's tie. So I don't know, I just, the whole energy in this scene, Jimmy and Kim are really fooling themselves about who they are and what they're doing. And we see this highlighted later on in the episode. Jimmy and Kim arrive at the courthouse. They are still dressing each other at the courthouse. Suzanne sees them and um, Kim comes over. She brings Suzanne the record of her client. Suzanne would have never found this. She outright says it. Why did you give this to me? Kim says, you know, it would come out in discovery. So again, this word discovery that we've heard so many times this season. Something I think that's really important to note in the very beginning of their meeting once they're in the office, which is Suzanne says to Kim, this is Jorge de Guzman. I'm sure you recognize him. Why is she sure Kim recognizes him? I don't think that we should assume that Suzanne would think Kim recognizes all of Jimmy's clients. I don't think we should assume that at all. I think the reason, I think it's very possible that the reason Suzanne says, I'm sure you recognize him, is because they know Kim went to see Lalo when they were holding them. And to me, this means that they feel Kim is possibly tied up in this just as much as Jimmy. Um, I don't know if Kim picked up on that. Uh, I don't know if I'm necessarily right, but why else would she say that? Why else would she say, I'm sure you recognize him? Kim doesn't deny that she recognizes him. Uh, what Kim does is when Suzanne says, uh, this is, uh, 
Eduardo Salamanca. Kim says, oh, who's that? So um, Kim didn't deny that she, she didn't say, oh, I don't know Jorge, Jorge Guzman, but she did act like, well, I don't know who Eduardo Salamanca would be. Suzanne goes on and, you know, the basic thing for them, the basic thing for the DA's office is Jimmy has now shown a history and a pattern of representing the cartel. It goes all the way back to the first season of the series. And it actually goes all the way back to the Kettlemans. The Kettlemans are so significant in Jimmy's story to becoming Saul. So yeah, uh, Suzanne and Gina Khalil uh, have suspicions about Jimmy. And Kim says, are you building a case uh, against Jimmy and Suzanne says not at the moment. That is not a good answer. That basically means yes We just need to find enough evidence to do it uh, So Suzanne is looking for evidence against Jimmy uh, She did mention Gina Khalil really thinks that Jimmy knows that Jorge de Guzman uh, is involved in the cartel. He knows his identity is really Lalo uh, and this could be because Jimmy let Lalo slip out of his mouth in the first episode when he runs into Gina Khalil and she questions him on Jorge de Guzman being made up. Nothing, no, all the information he gave was false. And uh, so hard to say whether uh, that moment where Jimmy lets Lalo, Lalo slips out is what leads to... Suzanne uh, talking to Kim about building a case against Jimmy. But that is where Kim finds herself. Now, two interesting things about um, Kim's whole reaction in all of this. Uh, she really doesn't react much. Uh, she does a good job of just sitting and listening until Suzanne describes the heinous, horrible act that Lalo committed until Suzanne says uh, the system failed. This was cold-blooded murder of a 22-year-old. She calls uh, Lalo a monster. She says the system failed and she says that, that Jimmy uh, should know better than to, get, to, to let a monster like Lalo go free. So when, uh, when Suzanne says that, Kim does react, and her reaction at that, this point is, it's Saul. Uh, telling Suzanne, it's not Jimmy, it's Saul. Uh, this touches on the, the, the very core of what Jimmy does with the name Saul. Uh, and, you know, really quickly, it's basically... In Jimmy's mind, and now in Kim's mind, Jimmy's a, a great stand-up guy. Saul, though, you know, Saul, he, he can do some crazy things. But that's not Jimmy. It's not really who Jimmy is. It's just the things that Jimmy does when he's using the name Saul. It's, you know, a bunch of bullcrap. Uh, we all kind of do this, to be honest. But um, it's just justification that allows Jimmy to do whatever he wants, um, but yet him and Kim can still feel, you know, Jimmy's a good guy. Uh, Saul just does these kind of really crazy things. Um, so Kim, uh, again, we mentioned in, uh, after the second episode, Kim is definitely moving away from the truth. She's turning a blind eye to the truth of the matter and we see her do it again here. No, 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 Jimmy didn't do those things. It was Saul that did those things. The other thing that Kim does in this meeting, Kim, you, you know, when Suzanne makes this proposal for Jimmy to come in and talk to Suzanne, Kim says, you want Jimmy to be a rat? Like, wait a minute, Kim, wait a minute. Being a rat is criminal talk. Uh, prosecutors, DAs, uh, public defenders, uh, you know, people, uh, judges, police officers, people in the system of the law, uh, like Kim, say CI, criminal informant. It's what they called Crazy Eight. Uh, 
uh, when he turned criminal informant for uh, Hank with Jimmy's assistance because Lalo, that's when Lalo hired Jimmy. Um, and so they say CI, criminal informant. Criminals say rat. And that was the word that Kim used. Uh, in this scene, we see Huel hiding in the staircase, and then he bumps into the parking attendant and you know gets the key and stuff. And then there's Huel and Jimmy in the car. This was a great scene. Huel asks the million dollar question. What are you and Kim doing? Uh, Jimmy says to Huel, uh, you, one, he says, you can't see the big picture. It's hidden from you. So, you know, Huel uh, can't really see what they're up to. Um, and then he says, uh, in a couple of months, people's lives are going to be changed or improved by what him and Kim are doing right now. Okay, as soon as he says this, what immediately pops in my head is, yeah, you know whose lives are going to be improved? Jimmy and Kim, because they're gonna take the Sandpiper settlement and buy that sweet ass mansion that they're gonna end up living in. And then Jimmy says, you know, they're doing the Lord's work. Uh, I think it's just pretty evident they're not doing the Lord's work. Uh, the last scene we see with Jimmy and Kim. So one, we see Jimmy, there's another white lie from Jimmy to Kim. Uh, Kim says Lalo's dead and Jimmy's shocked. Oh, he is, but Jimmy knew that Lala was gonna be killed, Mike told him, in the fifth season. Uh, so he, you know, he does, he acts shocked, oh my gosh. Uh, then Kim delivers him the news, and uh, Jimmy says, what should we do? And Kim says, you should do whatever you want. And we and you is a big deal with Jimmy and Kim. This dynamic existed uh, for a long time in the beginning, like I'd say from the second to the fourth season, it was a dynamic that came up often. Jimmy says we, Kim says you and me, okay? And then in the fifth season, uh, that seemed to go away. We, we didn't hear uh, Kim always stressing you and me. Uh, I don't know if we heard Jimmy say we so much either. Uh, but this dynamic seems to like take a back seat in the fifth season. We hear it again in this episode. Lastly, so then Kim, the advice Kim gives Jimmy, uh, it's not good advice. When uh, Jimmy was playing Irene, he wanted to get Irene to settle the Sandpiper settlement. He buys her like sneakers so that the other women will get jealous, think that Irene has all this money, and pressure Irene to settle the Sandpiper suit. Jimmy's plan works. Uh, Irene settles the suit, but Jimmy feels bad because nobody likes Irene anymore. He tries to fix it and he can't fix it. He goes to Kim for help. Kim does such a great job of giving Jimmy advice. And it's really, really close to exactly what she tells him in this episode. But the, the tiny difference in the two episodes is huge. So uh, when it came to Irene, Kim just kind of let Jimmy sit with things. She basically just said, you know what to do. And then she ended it. And then Jimmy thinks about it for a few minutes and he's like, yeah, I do know what to do. I have to basically give up this whole plan. Uh, and that's what he does. Jimmy does, I guess, the right thing, the closest to the right thing he can at the time. And uh, he gives up the whole plan and uh, lets everybody know it was him and not Irene that started all the trouble. And uh, this episode, the third episode of the sixth season, titled Rock and Hard Place, Kim does not do that. Kim tells Jimmy, you should do what you want. But then she says, do you want to be a rat? She says, do you want to be a friend of the cartel or do you want to be a rat? Wow, that is not advice, that is manipulation. If we look at the Irene situation again, um, the reason it's so different is because Kim just lets Jimmy sit with it. If it was more like what Kim said to Jimmy in this episode, 
concerning Irene, Kim would have said, you should do what you want, Jimmy. The only thing is, do you want to be rich or friends with a bunch of old ladies? That's, that's what Kim did in this episode. Instead of just saying, Jimmy, you should do what you want and then let Jimmy sit with it and find what he's morally comfortably doing. Uh, no, she, she says, but do you want to be a friend of the cartel or do you want to be a rat? Uh, you know, that's, that's manipulation. Kim was telling Jimmy not to be a rat, but it was her intentions were hidden. I don't know if we're supposed to assume that Kim is hiding more in this scene. I don't think so. I think we're just supposed to see that her intentions are hidden. She's pretending to tell Jim, she's pretending that, you know, she intends for Jimmy to do whatever he wants, but she's really manipulating him. She does not want Jimmy to be a rat. And that was the third episode of Better Call Saul. Really sad episode. Uh, Nacho's death was, uh, you know, it was devastating. So it was tough to watch. Uh, it, I am really confident in saying it will not be the last death we see. Uh, this is actually who is in our death pool. Uh, we think all four of these characters, and we can confirm one now, uh, will be dead by the end of the season. I did bring the G spot back. You may have noticed that in the beginning because I don't think I want to change the name after doing a couple of videos without it. Uh, I think I'm going to keep it and I am going to keep it specifically to the end of Better Call Saul. So we all have that to look forward to. Thanks so much for watching and have a great day.